in this homemaker vlog day in the life we're going to talk about just a couple key differences between a 1950s trad wife and a biblical housewife and we're going to talk about what it really means to be a godly wife homemaker and woman hi there i'm shayla I'm an earthy mountain mama and a happy homemaker wife. My husband and I have been married 20 years, come spring 2024. Thank you so much for being here. We have a homeschool family of eight. Two to four times a month I share a video here with wholesome scratch cooking and homemaking, homeschooling, and homesteading content, plus a short sweet devotional with hopes of being a light in this world. I am no spring chicken like so many similar YouTubers, but what I do have is 30 years experience in the art of frugal homemaking. I got a very early start. I've got a master's degree in herbology and 39 years experience in the homeschool and homestead world since my hubby and I are second generation homeschool and homesteaders. We would love to have you come along and join us here. So hit that subscribe button if you enjoy videos like this. The trees, they are singing to the tune of a song And the wind is gently ringing The bell that brings the morning The welcome of the dawn Lately, I have noticed a phenomenon. I'm seeing it more and more. It's on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and of course here on YouTube. <laughs> There's a new wave where old things are being made new. And amidst the craziness, People are looking to return to simpler, more traditional, older ways. I myself am an old soul. My husband and I were raised untraditionally. We were homeschooled and raised in homesteading ways with chickens and cows and gardens. Our mothers canned homegrown foods and our parents raised us with many good old fashioned ethics that still stand true and right today. But there's more to that story. We'll talk about that later on in this video. Along with this phenomenon where people are returning to ways of the past, I have been seeing another trend gaining popularity. This trend is where young homemakers try to combine being a trad 1950s type wife with being a biblical wife. <laughs> and many are also combining these things with being a homeschooling mom and there are a few large family mamas in that mix as well. I'm seeing an uptick in people who believe that these three things are synonymous though, and I wanna talk about that today. I suppose it isn't surprising that people think that these things are synonymous. When I started my own wife, Titus 2, Proverbs 31 journey, I thought the same thing. In fact, as a very young woman, I was actually even raised in a religious circle that taught this. Back then though, I was an extremely small minority and I never really thought I'd see a day when these things became, well, trendy. Today I want to talk about things I've learned about some of the major, very important differences between a trad 1950s type wife and a biblical housewife. I also want to make it clear where I stand to those that are following me here. First, it's story time. The other day I joined a Christian woman's group online. I was really excited to find it. And I thought it was going to be really special. I went about my day after finding that group and evening rolled around. I was relaxing with my family. Everybody was doing their own thing. And so I popped online. And one of the first things I saw was a post from the group, which reminded me, oh yeah, let's check this group out. <laughs> I was really excited to learn more about the group and I was excited to be inspired and hopefully learn something. I don't think I looked around much more than 10 minutes before I left the group in absolute and utter disgust. So what was it I saw that caused me to run away <laughs> and create this video? It was something that I've been noticing more and more of lately, and it has been disturbing to me and saddening. But what is worse is that I believe that what I saw was dangerous and has the potential to damage families and mothers and women. What I saw was essentially so many women claiming Christianity, claiming godliness, and yet arrogantly claiming the Bible 
with saying things that it does not in fact say. I'll talk about that more in a second, but first I want to talk about another related thing I saw a little bit before that, that thousands of conservative Christians were agreeing with and buying as biblical, and yet it was not, at least not entirely. The other day I saw a graphic it was illustrating the roles of a biblical godly home set up, and it wasn't biblically 100% accurate, yet it was claiming to be, and thousands and thousands of conservative Christians were lapping it up in the comments. If you go to Google, type in godly home umbrella. I'll show you a little sample of what it looks like here. When this first came out, this is what it looked like. Now there are all kinds though, and they're evolving. You can find ones where they even slip in church and pastor into levels underneath this thing. This umbrella graphic, it does have some truth, Ephesians 5, 22 through 24. But this umbrella also has things that the Bible does not say. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. And I'll tell you a dark secret about the guy who drew this up. First, you might be wondering what it was I saw in the group that made me run out the group's door. The first thing that I saw was a woman posted an excerpt from Housekeeping Monthly, May 13th, 1955. It was called The Good Wife's Guide. Maybe you've seen it. I'll talk more about it in a minute. But the top comments were women claiming that it was biblical and that it was what a Proverbs 31 woman was. Although that surprised me and the comments that it was synonymous with a biblical Proverbs 31 woman surprised me. I didn't leave the group right after that. I stayed a minute more until I saw the thing that made me leave the group. The thing that made me leave the group was a young woman asking for ideas of things she could do for some side income from home and the top comment that was proudly left for her and that was gaining over like 60 people's approval was another woman proudly stating she didn't do anything. That was her husband's job. So women of God and aspiring women of God, what does it mean to be a godly homemaker, a godly woman and a godly wife? Let's talk about what the Bible actually does say. First, let's look at a few verses though. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. There are so many scriptures like this. I'll put a few of them in the first comment in the comment section, but you can look them up yourself too. From these verses, we can see that misquoting scripture is a frightening and dangerous venture and it can lead us to destruction. When it comes to what the Bible says about what a godly woman is or what a godly home setup should be, we need to make sure we're actually using the Bible as our guide, which means <laughs> we need to look in our Bible. I'm not gonna go through and list every verse that outlines a woman's role, but again, I'll put some verses in the comments section for you below to check out yourself. But I will 1 Corinthians 11, 3, which reads, But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Something I want to point out here that's really critical is that this is speaking of a godly husband and wife arrangement of a husband and wife both under Christ. I'll get more into that and why that is important to fully understand in just a bit. Lastly, let's take a look at Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. A wife of noble character who can find she is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships, bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it. Out of her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed and it, she is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom, and faithful instruction 
is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. There are many, many more verses. In fact, you can say safely that most verses in the Bible are speaking to both men and women. So here we do have some truths that are black and white. It is so important though that we study the word of God for ourselves. What you need to watch out for in scripture are the gray areas. There's another thing you kind of have to watch out for when you're listening to other people interpret the word of God though. Matthew 7 15 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. So as you're reading and studying the scriptures, you got to watch out for the verses that have already been presented to you and interpreted for you by somebody else. When that happens, you must be careful that you read the verse through fresh eyes for what it says. And don't attach your previous opinion explaining the verse to as you do this, you will see there is a lot more gray area and there's a lot more grace than we sometimes would like to realize. Imagine that though. Imagine God having grace with us. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> Too often we pick a source that we think we can trust and we trust them to spoon feed the word of God to us. That is what happened with both the umbrella and seems to be what's happening with the good wife's guide. Allow me to explain. But before I do that, it is time for today's sponsor. You guys, I'm so excited to tell you that today's sponsor is yours truly. Since August of last year, I've been working with a designer named Crystal from New Shop Design. Together, we created an ultimate homemaker planner and an ultimate homeschool mom planner. One of the phrases I hear most as a work from home, homeschool, homemaking mama, is people will tell me, I don't know how you do it. It's simple really, and it's not a secret. I use a planner. We've worked really hard on this, and this planner is perfect, even if you're not used to using planners, or if you're afraid of using planners because you're not sure how to use them and you're afraid of messing it up. Planner's a PDF, you print your own, and you only print the pages that you need. It is an undated planner, so it does not expire, and if you mess up a page, you can simply print a new one. Nice thing about about undated is that if you have a whole week where you don't plan, hey, no problem. It's not wasted pages in the planner. You can pick up where you left off. I have over 30 years experience in the art of homemaking and I am pleased to present this planner. One of the nicest things about having a print your own planner is that you can add pages of your own that you want if you need to. For example, I have chickens. So in Canva, I created a sheet to track the things we need to keep track of with our chickens. The homeschool planner was just released. I am a second generation homeschooler and I have been in the homeschool world for about 39 years. The homeschool planner will be like having an experienced homeschool mom walk along beside you as you make plans for success in your homeschool. One of my favorite things about being a planner is that when I write things down and check them off, it makes it so I can not only stay on track, but so that I can actually see what all I accomplished through the week. I found that productivity seems to enhance and create more productivity. One of my favorite things about utilizing a planner is that by doing so, I am able to visualize and see and plan much more intentional days and carry out my goals as a Proverbs 31 woman far more effectively than I'm able to when I'm not using a planner. You're invited to go check those out in my shop in the description below. So let's get back to what we were talking about. I grew up in the 80s and 90s. It seemed like back then was the era of cults and there was constantly another one in the news. One of the things about how cults work is they need a following. One of the ways a cult leader will amass a following is by sharing a truth, which is a sugar coating, something you know to be good and true, but then they attach a lie to it. The lie is new and shiny, and when you believe the lie, this is what binds you to them because you want more of that so-called truth that only they have. So let's go back to that umbrella. The Bible does say that men are supposed to be heads of the home. The Bible does say that women are supposed to be keepers of the home and that they're to love and care for the children. 
we have science to back up the importance of mothers being with their young children. I and my husband obviously believe in the importance of a mother being home to raise her children. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the lifestyle that we do. But the Bible has a lot more to say to fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, than what is portrayed here. For example, fathers too are commanded to teach their children. What is more and what is nowhere in scripture that I can find is where it says that a godly home means the husband is the sole provider. I can't even find where it says the husband is supposed to be the sole protector. So to slap the title biblical on that umbrella is a bit of a stretch. I can find where the Bible says that he who doesn't take care of his own is worse than an infidel. But I think it's common sense to know that he is a pronoun used throughout the Bible. And we know that just because it says he all over the place in the Bible, that is not excluding women. <laughs> and in fact, if you look this up in the original Greek language, which you can do with the Strong's Concordance, the original Greek language is not in fact excluding women. It is including them. We will come back around to that in a minute. So friends, the umbrella stems from a 1950s stereotype that, to my knowledge, made a comeback in the 90s. In fact, I'm old enough to remember when this was made and who it was made by. The illustration was made popular by Bill Gothard. You can look him up. He was a big deal in Christian conservative circles in the 90s when I was a teenager and a young adult. He had a very large following and his teachings even made it into the religious group that I was in. The truth came out eventually though. Gothard ended up being a cult leader who never married, never had kids, and was eventually accused of sexual molestation of minor girls. He was the leader the Duggars followed, and we all know how that went. So now we have a resurgence of this good wife's guide. I'm seeing an uptick of women claiming that this is biblical, that it is what it means to be a godly wife, and saying that a godly wife does all of these things. So let's take a look at the Good Wife's Guide. The Good Wife's Guide. Have dinner ready. Plan ahead, even the night before, to have a delicious meal ready on time for his return. This is a way of letting him know that you have been thinking about him and are concerned about his needs. Most men are hungry when they come home, and the prospect of a good meal, especially his favorite dish, is part of the warm welcome needed. Prepare yourself. Take 15 minutes to rest so you will be refreshed when he arrives. Touch up your makeup, put a ribbon in your hair, and be fresh looking. He has just been with a lot of work weary people. Be a little gay and a little more interesting for him. His boring day may need a lift, and one of your duties is to provide it. Don't greet him with complaints and problems. Don't complain if he's late home for dinner, or even if he stays out all night. Consider this as minor compared to what he might have gone through that day. Clear away the clutter. Make one last trip through the main part of the house just before your husband arrives. Gather up school books, toys, paper, etc., and then run a dust cloth over the tables. Over the cooler months of the year, you should prepare and light a fire for him to unwind by. Your husband will feel he has reached a haven of rest and order, and it will give you a lift too. After all, catering for his comfort will provide you with immense personal satisfaction. Prepare the children. Take a few minutes to wash the children's hands and faces if they are small. Comb their hair and if necessary, change their clothes. They are little treasures and he would like to see them playing the part. Minimize all noise. At the time of his arrival, eliminate all noise of the washer, dryer, or vacuum. Try to encourage the children to be quiet. Be happy to see him. Greet him with a warm smile and show sincerity in your desire to please him. Listen to him. You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but the moment of his arrival is not the time. Let him talk first. Remember, his topics of conversation are more important than yours. Make the evening his. Never complain if he comes home late or goes out to dinner or other places of entertainment without you. Instead, try to understand his world of strain and pressure and his very real need to be at home and relax. Your goal, try to make sure your home is a place of peace, order, and tranquility where your husband can renew himself in body and spirit. Make him comfortable. Have him lean back in a comfortable chair or have him lie down in the bedroom. Have a cooler warm drink ready for him. Arrange his hello and offer to take off his shoes. Speak in low, soothing, and pleasant voice. Don't ask him questions about his actions or question his judgment or integrity. Remember, he is the master of the house and as such will always exercise his will with fairness and truthfulness. You have no right to question him. A good wife always knows her place. Again, this is an excerpt from The Good Wife's Guide, Housekeeping Monthly, 13th of May, 1955. Once again, I'm addressing this because I'm seeing an uptick of women claiming that this is biblical. I will link to this article 
in the description box below so you can read it for yourself. I think it's really interesting to note that the daughters of the people who lived this way were the women's lib feminists of the 60s and 70s, the ones that were very angry. <laughs> I don't know about you, but after reading this, it kind of explains why the women's lib movement went berserk after the 50s and maybe why the daughters of that generation were as angry as they were. I am not a feminist or a women's liber. I am a Christian homemaker and I believe that being a Christian homemaker and a homeschool mom is my greatest ministry. I believe this job is one of the most important jobs a mother can have. This list, on the other hand, my husband's response to this list was, where's the one with how to be a good husband? Okay, so I'm going to just say that there are some things on this list that are nice ideas, but some of them are quite sick. Claiming that this list is what a godly or biblical wife is, is completely delusional. You can be a good wife and not do one of the things on this list. Matthew 23, 4 comes to mind when I read this article. It reads, and they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. Perhaps the comeback of this list and seeing it in that group triggered me because you see I was taught this list growing up. Not only have I known people in my life who fully embrace this article, but I actually tried living it during my first years of marriage back when I was an oddity and a minority though. So since I've had some experience with this and seen others live their entire lives by this guide, I'm here to tell you something. Ladies, I've personally seen good men and good marriages spoiled by this, and I've seen wives made ill by trying to do all of these things while trying to combine them with being a large family mom or a homeschooling mom or a working mom or all. To date, I really only know of one couple who lives like this. At last I heard, they hadn't slept in the same room for years and the wife made it very, very abundantly clear that the two of them do not talk to each other. And yet she did most of the things on that list. Since this list is making a comeback, I feel I just need to state something. The good wife's guide and being a biblical wife or a godly wife are not one and the same. When we confuse biblical truths with things like this, it can put so much unnecessary burden on us that insanity and confusion can often follow. I talked earlier about how I had been a homemaker for 30 years. It's actually more like 31 now. I was taught most of these 1950s good wife rules growing up even as a teenager. I remember being taught some of them word for word in a young ladies class that what I kind of hesitate to call our church did one time. One time an older 1950s wife that I knew told me that if I ever lost track of time and forgot to get dinner started on time put some onions in the oven. The smell would trick my husband when he got home and he would be happy thinking I had something good cooking when in fact I had forgotten and was just getting started with dinner. <laughs> One of the reasons I think that following teachings like this is dangerous is because we don't live in 1950 and some people are working to their own demise trying to live up to this 1950 stereotype thinking well this is what a godly woman does when it isn't and i don't think a lot of us even realize how those teachings on this list have permeated so much of society today some of the things on this list like i said they're sweet they're thoughtful they're considerate yes they are great ideas but to say you have to do them to be a good wife is ridiculous and to put this on a woman who is working or a homeschooling mom or a mom that has a lot of children is preposterous. Yet, you know what? I know that there are women out there doing exactly this to themselves and pushing it on others and yet in the end, tearfully crumbling and wondering why they can't get it all done and why they have anxiety so bad that they cannot even think or breathe clearly anymore. The 1950s good wife was not a farm wife with animals. She wasn't having much more than two children. She wasn't homeschooling. She wasn't working at any jobs. And I'll tell you who pointed that out to me. Not long after I turned 40 and perimenopause hit and I wasn't able to do all of the things anymore. <laughs> it was my therapist that pointed this out. Yeah, I landed myself in therapy and my therapist pointed out that I still was holding on to 1950 stereotypes, allowing them to form a lot of my beliefs and thought patterns 
And since I was also trying to work from home and I was also homeschooling, I was dealing with immense guilt and feelings of being a failure because I was finding it impossible to do it all no matter how hard I tried. And I became physically ill and mentally drained. There were other factors, I will admit, but this was definitely one of them. I had been putting so much on myself that I didn't even realize half of it wasn't necessary. And half of it was decades old teaching that worked in another time and era, but did not apply in this one. I want to tell you a story. I was blessed to have four grandmothers. I loved my grandmother so much. I just lost the last of them this last winter. My grandmas, I just adored them, friends, all of them. Two of them were step grandmas, and I also had a great grandmother and a biological grandma, and I loved them all so much. One of the things I really loved was when they told stories from the old days. Believe it or not, I love so many things about the times gone by, but we have to have common sense, and we have to know that there was more than just pretty vintage picturesque scenes happening back in the old days. <laughs> My grandmothers and aunts have told me a few stories. You guys, it is a well-known fact that many women of the 1950s era were not doing well. And they didn't have perfect marriages despite being a good wife. Mentally, they were often a mess and were over-prescribed psychotropic drugs like Valium. I learned this from one of my grandmothers and it was validated by another as well as an aunt. If my husband was staying out all night, leaving me with the kids and I wasn't allowed to say anything or complain, I might not think Valium was such a bad idea either. (laughs) Thankfully, I have a good man who loves the Lord and I don't have to worry about that. The truth is though, being a 1950s good wife was not the formula for a good marriage and a happy family like some of us would like to believe and it certainly was not synonymous with a biblical marriage. In the Bible, we do have the secret recipe for a healthy, good marriage, though. And the thing is, it takes two. Ephesians 5.33 reads, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So much of Ephesians 5 is such a wonderful place to start if you want to learn what the Bible says about how to have a godly and a good marriage. All right. So I would like to present or suggest an alternative to this trad wife trend. What about the idea of a godly wife and woman? If you Google what is a godly woman or wife, you will find whole blogs dedicated to decoding and explaining the answer in great detail. I think for some reason, some of us like to complicate things and embellish simple truths until it looks nothing like the original. In all fairness, I think it's because since we were created in god's image and god was a creator this is one of the things about us we too like to create that's just my theory (laughs) but isn't that what we women like to do in our homes we like to create the perfect to us home or at least try to but there's something else that some of us can do that isn't pretty and i have no exception Unfortunately, I have memories of my early days on Facebook to remind me of this. (laughs) What can I say? When we are young, we often have a hunger and a thirst for what we believe in. And we have a desire so strong to be right and accurate. And we oftentimes believe so strongly in what we believe in that a lot of times we can get to thinking that the way we do things is the only right way to do them. And this is when we get into trouble. I encourage you as Christians, as Christian homemakers, as godly women to just go directly to your Bibles. Do word studies. Use the strongest concordance if you're confused on the meaning of something. Look to your Bibles though for what it actually says regarding a woman's role and be really careful not to add to it. I've already covered some of the verses that speak of a godly woman's role. However, I think there's something else that we need to take into consideration and it's really big. These verses were written outlining a godly husband and wife establishment and setup. These are the goals we are to try to live by. There are times, however, when husbands and wives step outside of God's word and will and completely step out from underneath God. When this happens, the Bible in many places calls us to say something, not to just follow along. For example, 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13, it reads, 
But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not to even eat with such a person. I want to point something out about that word reviler. If you look up the meaning of it, it actually means an abusive person in speech. I would like to clarify that I'm not condoning divorce here. I'm simply saying there are situations, including abuse, that we're not supposed to just put up with. All right, so think about this for a minute and let's let it sink in. So one of the key differences between a trad wife and a biblical wife is a trad wife would go along with whatever, never questioning. We do have 1 Peter 3, 1 that some people believe supports that. It reads, in the same way, you wives be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As far as using this verse as an excuse to go along with whatever and submit to whatever, I think this is where we need to consider a much broader context of the scripture. For example, we have a rather jolting example in the Bible of a wife who did not question her husband. She submitted and she went along and did every single thing he told her to, and she paid for it with her life. Now, some could argue that she was an actual participant in the activities. However, I would say if she was supposed to just being a submissive wife, she of course would have been participating. So Acts 5, 1 through 11, we have a story of a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira. So they sold a piece of property and he kept back part of the money for himself and his wife knew about this, but he brought the rest of it and put it at the apostles' feet. The apostles knew that he was being dishonest though and they questioned him. He admitted he was holding back a portion and shortly after that God struck him dead. About three hours later, scriptures read that his wife came in. Peter asked her, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? So she lied and she said that yes, it was the price. Again, remember her husband, you know, told her she was supposed to be submitting, right? Well, Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and will carry you out also. And at that moment, she fell down dead at his feet and died. So let me ask you this. If Sapphira was supposed to never question her husband, if she was doing her biblical wifely duties commanded in the scriptures, why was she even questioned, let alone struck dead by God? Obviously, there is more to this. This is why we need to take all of the scriptures as a whole and study them. So by this story, this is my understanding, which could be wrong, but it is that she was accountable to God and expected to do the right thing. The Bible has a lot to say about obeying sinful authorities that have completely gone astray to the dark side and stepped out of God's ways. I, again, highly encourage you to do your own studies on this. I want to talk about another example of traditional 1950s good wife versus biblical wife. And it's an area many conservative Christians mistake from the Bible and where I see so much judgment. And I personally have been judged by other women in. And this is one area that actually can lead some families into financial trouble, especially in old age. And it's in the area of whether or not a woman, you know, like a biblical woman should or shouldn't have a job. So is it ungodly for a wife and a mother to have a job? So many have bought the fallacy that to be a biblical or a godly housewife and a homemaker means to leave 100% of the providing up to the husband. This belief is apparently making a big comeback. I see these cat fights on the internet going on about this all the time. The Bible actually does talk about this and not in the way many people think. Friends, the Proverbs the woman was industrious read it, read it again. She was obviously so successful that she was able to invest in land. She looked to the future and she smiled. You know what? If you've invested, I think it's pretty easy to smile when thinking about the future. <laughs> but how many of us are able to invest living on one income? Let's go back to 1 Timothy 5.8. It says, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. All right, I already pointed out that if you look this up in the original Greek language, which you can do with the Strong's Concordance, it is absolutely speaking to women as well. I think it's really important to consider the obvious fact that there are many ways in which a family means care, and there are many seasons in which different kinds of care are called for. For example, small children are kind of a full-time job. They need so much care and habit training and teaching and simply watching over just to keep them alive. Something I love that my husband told me when we were first getting to know each other 20 over 
20 years ago, was that he wanted to marry a homemaker and that he didn't want his children being raised by a babysitter. He said if he wanted his children to be like the babysitter, he would have married the babysitter. <laughs> but kids do grow and there come seasons and there come transitions. And we can't do a lot to change the fact that it costs to live in this world. Around 20 years ago, I was listening to a woman. She had been one of the 1950s homemakers. Her husband had always been the breadwinner and she a 1950s good wife and homemaker. She was very frugal and had so many great tips. She was telling me one time, however, about a young family that we both knew of that had fallen on hard times. They were losing their home. The woman was going on and on about how this family was so foolish because in order to get their home in the first place, they went to the bank to get a loan, which this woman was convinced was a grave sin. So the recession hit and now they were losing their home. You know, this is one of my biggest qualms in Christianity. With too many Christians, you are just damned if you do and damned if you don't. You know, I ask, what was that young family supposed to do? Live in tents, homeless, all to avoid going to the bank to get a loan until they could save up enough money? So we have families out there struggling to get by. Since 2012, the middle class has dropped into the working class for the majority, and the majority are living paycheck to paycheck. Now, I know there are families that do live too extravagantly, but there are families that do not, that are under so much stress. Fathers getting run into the ground and digging early graves, thinking that they cannot let their wives pitch in because if they do, that they would lose their man card and most certainly lose their Christian man card and wives thinking it's the husband's role to be the provider in the Christian home when this is simply not true. Look at Proverbs 31 again. Let's look at another verse, Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And I'll talk more about this, but first I want to share my experience trying to live out the 1950s wife thing. First couple years of my marriage, I was trying really hard. <laughs> Remember, I had been taught these things growing up. When I started out my homemaking journey, I loved that good wife's guide for the most part, I thought, oh, here's a formula. And if I follow it, I will have a happy marriage. I also read other similar writings, books like Created to Be His Helpmeet and The Total Women. You can look them up. I do not recommend them at all. So I followed all this advice in these books and in this guide. And for the first years, I tried very hard. Two things happened. The first was I found a lot of the things in the books were simply not true. And one of the things that happened was my husband didn't come home until the late hours of the night, not because he was up to no good, because he was working so hard. We lived in a home that was in such bad condition that the owners wouldn't even charge us rent because doing so would have required them to make repairs. We literally had snow drifts in our first home. It was so bad. I've talked about this in another video. So my husband was working tirelessly to improve our situation. And you can't do most things on this list very often if your husband isn't there to do them for. <laughs> But when he was, and when I would do these things, he was under so much stress and he was also young and he didn't have the ability to appreciate these at the time. My efforts were not really appreciated. So this, this left me 110% a confused mess. <laughs> you see, my husband didn't want all of that. He wanted the real me and the real me was much more than all of that 1950s good wife act. It didn't take me long to realize that my role as my husband's help me was gonna be a bit different than everything I had been taught about the perfect 1950s good wife. So I looked at what was burdening my husband and what he was working towards and I started looking at what I could do to truly be his help me. Now, as mentioned before, some of the teachings were so deeply ingrained in me that they took years to completely let go of. My husband is one of the hardest working men I've ever met. He's a laborer and he's worked so hard since he was 13. So I do what I can to help him. And I have been judged by other women for it. Women whose husbands bring home double and triple what mine has. And women who don't live on my budget. Just a year ago, a wealthy retired woman was telling me, you should just let your husband worry about the providing. You know, sometimes it never ceases to amaze me how forward and impudent Christians can be with each other. I gently explained to her that she did not know our financial situation, that things like her experience with retirement were likely a luxury that I and many people like me would never know unless we do try to do what we can now. So just to confirm what the Bible says about the topic, the Proverbs 31 woman was a woman the Bible has given 
to us as an example. And she not only ran her home and looked well to the ways of her household, as it says, but she was industrious. She had side gigs going. She had businesses. She was investing in fields. She looked to the future with wisdom and she invested. She did not leave all the providing to her husband. But I think we do need to talk about the Titus to woman here as well because I believe this is one place a lot of people read things into that are just simply not there. Titus 2, 3 through 5, women are told to be busy at home, to be kind and subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. It seems that there are a lot of people who take this verse to mean that a woman's only godly choice is to be a homemaker and that she should just be content staying home, having children, being a homemaker, and that a godly husband is to be the sole provider. And yet, <laughs> the same Christians will when the family can't buy a home or when they lose their home like the family I talked about above or when they come across hard times and God forbid need something like food stamps the same Christian will abhorrently judge them for their hard times friends we Christians can be horrid at times and so misguided as I was reminded by the brief time in that group the other day it seems women can sometimes be the absolute worst what is really something is we make these off-the-cuff judgments no harm to us and then when hard times do come to us we don't put two and two together Obviously, Titus 2 verse 5 is saying women are to be keepers at home, but the Bible has a whole lot more to say about what a woman should and shouldn't be. And being a keeper at home is just one of our responsibilities, as I've already pointed some of the things out that it says. If we take all of the Bible verses as a whole, we can see that the whole point is that our home, the husband, the children, and the ministry is to be our main focus, loving our families and raising Christian children in the Lord as commanded in the scriptures, making sure that they are cared for. And all that we do is to support that central focus so that the kingdom of God will thrive and grow and that God will be glorified. I want to clarify one thing. I do believe that mothers and children are meant to be together, especially young children is what I'm speaking of here. There have been so, so many studies conducted that have proven it is not good for young children to be separated from their mothers. I strongly believe that young children need their mamas and that it's best for mamas to be with their young children. I believe the ideal situation for a mother with young children is to not have to work if possible until her kids are older. It is best to wait until they are older. That is because of how difficult it is trying to manage anything other than the home and small children. It is an extremely difficult task, especially if you are adding a part-time job or a job in with that. Obviously, I believe it is most ideal to homeschool and be able to work from home. Otherwise, I wouldn't be making this choice in my life. You see, I believe family and that if people have kids, that raising a Christian family should be the priority. Absolutely, I believe that there are too many people that have their priorities backwards. But what I do not condone is saying that the Bible says things that it doesn't. So to wrap things up, there are some things that the 1950s had going on. These dresses, for example, they're pretty. And there are some things from this good wife's guide that are sweet that would benefit any marriage. But it needs to be both ways, except for the staying out all night stuff that is hogwash. What is best is to seek to be a godly, loving, truthful, honest wife and homemaker. So being a 1950s trad wife or good wife and a biblical wife are not one and the same. To be a woman of God, a godly homemaker is simply to love God and seek him in our lives and homes. Of course, the best way to do this is to read his word and apply it. It isn't to follow some busy, cumbersome rules from the 1950s.